All right, how's everybody doing? Welcome to Tuesday. Oh man, it's Tuesday, August 4th. Yes, we are here live in Chicago. I'm Mike Jeff for Chicago Jazz Magazine, chicagojazz.com. Of course, you are watching Chicago Music Revealed, episode 85. Can you believe that? Episode 85, we started doing this at the beginning, somewhat towards the beginning of the pandemic, and we're still rolling around, unfortunately, in the pandemic. So everybody, hopefully everybody's staying away from everybody, everybody's sanitizing their hands, wearing masks, being COVID safe, being safe, and staying socially distanced, but enjoying live music because the Jazz Showcase is open Thursday through Sunday. Fitzgerald's is doing some great stuff. I know that Mike Reed is going to start doing some things up at Constellation. Andy's is trying to do some things in a COVID safe environment. So it's important for all of us to get out there and support the clubs, venues, in addition to all of these incredible musicians that Chicago has to offer. Also, as I always say, I'm also the director of programming and entertainment at the Epiphany Center for the Arts, right there on Adams and Ashland. We're gonna be opening up September 1 with a live music program with limited seating and also a pay-per-view platform that we're gonna be announcing later this week. I know I keep saying that, but I promise you the ticketing platform is in place. We are dangerously close to being able to announce things, so stand by for that. But very cool thing, DK's just filmed a live performance by Denise Times, who was on the show last week. They just did it last week over in the sanctuary. So you're gonna get a sneak peek at the beginning of September before we even launch, because I just saw the video myself and it looks great. She sounds wonderful. So. Looking forward to having everybody over there. Epiphany Center for the Arts, 201 South Ashland Avenue. More to come, epiphanyshy.com. Of course, go check that out. Now, without further ado, we Matt Eulery and I have been trying to connect for, I don't know, what has it been, four or five months, and then a pandemic got in the way and, you know, everything else. But we are finally connecting today. And, you know, what usually never happens here on Chicago Music Revealed is that we actually have something where it's like breaking news, like his new release is actually launching today. So that's exciting news. And Matt's on the phone. Matt, how are you? Hey, Mike. I am uh, fine. I'm just fine. It's a beautiful day, though. It is beautiful, isn't it? It's it's awesome. Uh, Yeah, the the new record's out, Pollinator. Um, It's crazy that we're talking and and doing this uh, promoting of what all you're you know you're you're always promoting music in chicago you know um we all we see it we appreciate it and i appreciate you um well you know talking to me on today today and as this uh record is coming out on an unprecedented time of prohibition you know i i read the liner notes and i love what you said now first we should talk about it a little bit before i even go into that but i, I love what you said about the prohibition thing we're going to get to that in one second because the name of the release as you mentioned pollinator and it's really and you tell me if i'm wrong it's kind of, kind of you're paying homage to the 1920s a hundred years later and it's interesting because you recorded this back in 2019 in june mm-hmm. so none of us knew that we were going to be under actually a gigantic prohibition right now and it all sort of ties together strangely but you know hats off because this music as i told you before we came on the air it sounds like you know the, the, the 1920 swing music but hipped up to 2020 but it doesn't lose any flavor it, it you're really you're really you're paying tribute to the great artists that performed back then and this music is truly timeless isn't it Oh, swing, man. You know, um, it's a big deal. It's it's American music. It's African American music. And, um, you know, we, we have so much deep respect for those musicians that really helped invent and cultivate this, this style of swing that were happening, starting to happen uh, just about a hundred years ago. I mean, I mean, by the early twenties, there was certainly a a real, a quite a sophisticated development of the music at that point, um, as we started to hear it on record. But yeah, um, I've been, you know, a student and uh, player, appreciator, lover of, of swing music of all kinds, you know, from the 20s until now. And as you know, I'm sure most of your listeners realize that, that those brands of swing, they really, um, they, they just it just keeps evolving so like it's just always expanding more styles more styles and so um you know this is my 10th record actually yeah and it's taken me 
this long, as much as I've been, you know, like jazz music swing has been kind of like, in my mind, my main thing as a bassist for um, 25 years or so. It's taken me this long to actually write a, a whole set of music that is purely swing, uh, which is why I um, I went back to my original, my, my first instrument, the sousaphone, for this record and um, put together a, a band, basically, to play this stuff. Um, well, you know, and, and listening... To celebrate it. Yeah, and, and, and listening to the group, and, you know, obviously, I know a lot of the players, and we'll talk about who's on the recording, too, but, I mean... You know, this is not easy music to play. I mean, and and even like the original, like going back to original 1920s stuff, right? I mean, you know, you're talking mm-hmm. about early Duke Ellington, obviously, and you're talking yep. about yep. you're talking about Jelly Roll uh, Morton and some of that, mm-hmm. and and all different levels. That is that's really difficult music to play correctly, but just to play in general, I don't think a lot of people understand that because, you know, when you listen to swing music, oh, it's from the 20s, it can't be that hard to play. Well, no, it's really difficult to uh-huh. play. And the way it's got to layer together and and then as a unit be able to swing, I think that's the difference too because back then, you tell me if I'm wrong, but back then, like the rhythm section, all that, the rhythm section and the horn sections, they had to work in tandem to make the music swing. They weren't thinking like the rhythm section's doing this and the horn player's blowing mm-hmm. solo over the top. And I mean, to me, the the melody, everybody's working together to make that feel happen within the context of, of the melody. I mean, that's what I hear when I listen to, to really good swing bands play. Yeah, well said. I mean, first of all, let me say that No, I would say... If I can just speak for the six of us <laughs> that yeah. play this music on this record in this band, Pollinator, um, that none of us are really experts like other musicians are that play the music as a, a really truly in the style of the you know, like 20s, uh, 1920s, mm-hmm. like uh, you know like the Fat Babies and Cellar Door Boys, Boys in Town. You know, like those those people are, are deeply, uh, I don't know, they. They, they respect that music so much and they really play it well in a, that style. And so that's not exactly what this is because none of us really specialize in that. But it's cool because we're, I think the we're taking the approach with this music and this band. I mean, I wrote all the tunes, mm-hmm. um, but part of the concept of the band is to have, like you were saying, have all the players basically be playing almost all the time and doing what jazz bands used to do which is accompany each other pretty much the whole time, mm-hmm. you know? So there's, you know, there's, there's written material, there's written forms and, and breaks and, and things um, in this music. But I, I ask, you know, if there's a trumpet solo going on, there's, you know, the trombone player and the tenor player are improvising the accompaniment in the style that would have been done, you know, back then. And that's what I think one of the, the essence is of the music that has been not lost, but it's just, it's not been focused on as much when playing swing music. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, well, and you, you mentioned the fat babies and, and, and those groups, those guys, I, I consider them as like, uh, uh, you know, historians because they're really, they really yeah. understand the nuances of all of that as a composer. And, you know, you mentioned this is your 10th recording. I mean, you, your compositional style has changed. It hasn't changed. It seems like each recording that you do, you take on a different sort of sort of project and your compositional mm-hmm. style changes to work with mm-hmm. that concept that you're doing for that specific project. And when it comes to this, how much studying did you have to go back and do to really, I mean, you have to go back and obviously, you know, study, but I mean, you must have had to go back and really kind of deep dive on some of the composers from the 20s just to understand what we're talking about right now, because this isn't something you can just mm-hmm. listen to and say, oh, OK, yeah, yeah I'm going to put all of these rhythms together and it's all going to work and I'll just harmonize it this way. And wonderful. You know, this has to be a kind of a different project for you. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, really, this this is for fun for me. And, yeah. and if anyone's ever heard any of my other recordings or seen any certain shows that has had my name on it um that it, it's you know a lot of that other stuff is a lot more serious a lot deliberately less um 
blues based, deliberately less swing and or bebop based. You know, mm-hmm. uh, not that, not that I had, I had to just all learn all that stuff. I mean, that's like that's just part of being a musician. You play all the styles, right. especially you know rhythm bass players. And so, um, I wouldn't say that. This time I like went and did like a ton of research, like a great novelist would do, you know, like doing like all the hours of research. This was more like a pet project for me in the beginning. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just, I started, I think I just started writing one or two kind of fun to be swing type of tunes. And, and then it just kind of come together. Like, what am I going to do with this music? And that's usually how I work. Like I'll just, you know, stop trying to do mm-hmm. anything and just let, you know, try and just like turn the tap on and see what comes out. And then, um, I often don't know where to, what home that certain idea will, will find until it just reveals itself. So these, this music, uh, just, you know, early last year that I wrote in 2019 and I, it was, it all happened very, very organically and easy because it was, I'm pretty sure all those tunes I just sang like a, a melody to my phone mm-hmm. or whatever was going to come out and, and, and then just um, developed it from there, you know, by Is that adding a... the harmony and chord changes. And that's just, and that just happened. So like that stuff was just in there from just years of, of, of playing and listening. Is that your process? Like with all of your projects, do you, if something comes to you, you know, you might be, I remember talking to Orber Davis and he, he got a lot of inspiration. He, I don't know if it's inspiration, but just his mind opened up. He got a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas when he was by water or, you know, when he was walking in the woods or something, but Orber specifically, I remember with the water thing, because he felt like when he's by water, there's osmosis and there's some freeing thing and his mind frees up. But with your process dependent not even specific to this project. I mean, when you come up with something, are you usually just somewhere you start hearing some melodies and stuff and you sing it into your phone and then you can start to kind of conceptualize it from there. And then all of a sudden it turns into an, or, you know, I mean, you, you presented it at millennium park on the main stage with, with a, a, a full orchestra and a, and a big band yeah. and all that. I mean, you know, so when you start putting these things together, is that how like the, the, the start of the project might happen is because you might hear something and say, Hmm, that's kind of interesting. And you start working off of it from there. Mm. I love what Orbert said, he, by the way, or- Orbert Davis is a brilliant drummer player, composer. Yeah. Uh, I'm a fan. So for the record, <laughs> uh, I like what he said about water. Um, I think it's, if you're, if you're moving somehow, if you're, if you're around some movement of any kind, whether you see movement such as water mm-hmm. or, if you're physically moving, like while walking, or driving, or riding, uh, I feel uh, on any kind of you know car, or train, whatever. Yeah, I feel like those those can be really potent times to to be able to catch an initial spark or of an idea of something, compositionally speaking. Um, and and some somehow that it just helps that that motion. Um, I don't I can't really explain that, but yes, it is a. I would say that that's a pretty typical process. Um, like that initial, initial spark idea that I mentioned, you know, if, if you have like even a little thing, I mean, what's an idea is a, is a big question. Yeah. You know, that could be anything. It could be a melody, it could be a rhythm, could be something that you feel in your body. Could be, yeah. Not like a, if you put your hands on the, on the piano, just kind of randomly see what happens. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you use, everyone uses their, their own experience in history um, to, to sort of acknowledge what that sound or an idea is. And then it's up to that own individual to just, you know, sit down and do the work and see what re- reveals itself to you and just to, to be patient with that. Uh, and I'm talking about developing a, you know, a composition. Mm-hmm. But I suppose you can, you can use that for any number of universal tasks, I guess. Well, and, and, you know, to your credit, too, I mean, this is your 10th recording. And I, I had Tana Alexa on yesterday, and she just put out uh, a brand new recording, which is, you know, incredible. And, and there's a lot of layers to it, uh, Ona. And that came out, and she record, started recording in 2017, and it took this long to get it to fruition. But there's a lot of different um, 
uh, you know, a lot of different styles all melded together. But I talked to her a little bit and, and, and you're similar to this, meaning you can come up with something, you can create it, you can put it together and you can actually take it from start to finish and put it out mm -hmm. so the world can hear it no matter what, you know, which recording it was, was that's really difficult for anybody. And, you know, from an artist standpoint, a lot of artists might have some ideas and they might put things down, but it's that implementation to take it from start point A all the way to point Z and get the thing out and mm -hmm. get it to where you want it to be. I mean, is this like just something because you're you're disciplined enough where you can say, you know what, I'm this sounds really good. I'm going to do something with this, and and it just uh, organically keeps going until all of a sudden, boom, it comes out because you're you're disciplined and you continuously put it together until it finally comes out. Or is there another process that you you work from? Because I'm always curious because I mean I know how difficult yeah, it is to do this too. stuff. Yeah, me too. I mean, I always look at it just as it's it's all experimental. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't really, I've never really had, thankfully, um, too high of hopes or agendas <laughs> to, to get stuff done. I just, you know, you know, we, everybody who's creative has really good, probably has good taste. And mm -hmm. so we just keep, keep trying to do the thing that we like as a, as a listener or as a, you know, um, somebody who consumes the art, we, we, we like, oh, I like that. Yeah. So, you know, your taste is that good. You just keep trying to do it until, you know, you say, oh, I like that, you know, just like you would if it was somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't I don't know how disciplined I am. I, am. I mean, I actually think I'm rather lazy, but you know, hard, hard on myself. I mean, we could all work a lot harder. Come on. You know, I trust. trust I mean, I don't me. like you. You're working. You're working harder than, you know, probably most people. Uh, I, I, um, we all beat ourselves up, I think, because we're all striving to try to get more. Right. And do more and, and create more. That's the way I look at it. But I mean, you're able to put out these yeah. recordings and and you know that's that's a it's a big deal to start somewhere from nothing and then all of a sudden put something mm -hmm. out and um you know i love what you just said because i mean it it you know a lot of the creative people they have good taste and they do what they love and maybe that's part of it right because you love you do what you love you're loving it this isn't really necessarily work obviously i'm sure there's a lot of tedious aspects of it that are like oh sure. god can somebody else handle this for me but, 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 you know, you, you get it from start to finish. And, and I'm always curious about that when somebody has put out so much, so many, so many projects as you have, and you're starting them from scratch and getting them, getting them finally out. So, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. congratulations. I mean, you know, it's, it's quite a feat and number think, 10, man. holy cow. You know? Yeah. So, well, I guess like I kind of, you know, in, in hindsight or just a little bit of perspective, like the album hasn't really even been a thing until when like the early like in the 70s sometimes yeah. it, it, like when the album came out that's actual true. like full like 40 40 minutes of music yeah because they were just releasing then, 45s right side a and side b and that I, was it i believe yeah and there you know there was like the collection of, of short tracks that that you know labels were putting together mm -hmm. but it's like a, a band making an album wasn't a thing until um i don't even know when late mm -hmm. 70s i don't even know when like the rec when when you could make a record without a, you know a huge record label paying for it because like obviously the technology was so such that most people couldn't afford to be able to do it mm -hmm. you know the recording studio and all that um so i guess like i'm just fortunately and I'm, I'm i know i'm not alone of course but came came up in a time where when I started getting really into music and it was like punk bands and stuff and all this stuff was DIY and my, my first bands were just kind of like DIY punk and punk ska bands um, in, in the, I don't know, mid nineties, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. And so like, it was always, it's just always been standard practice for me as a musician since I was like a teenager or yeah, preteen. Mm -hmm. that that's what you do you have a band you write some songs you go to the studio you make a record <laughs> you put it out <laughs> and i don't take it for granted but like that the fact that 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 hasn't even really been a thing that long it's kind of funny mm -hmm. and um now that i'm on a roll 
I just I want to keep doing it. It's just like a fun art project. Oh, it's a fun art project making yeah. a record. Yeah. Well, I it, you know it's 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 an undertaking, but to your point, it's a fun art project. So if you're thinking yeah. of it that way, I could see you know I mean you, you spend hours and hours and hours and hours on this. I mean hundreds mm -hmm. of hours on things like this, and to be able to mm -hmm. put it out. It's it's what you want. It's your creativity, but it's fun, and that really comes mm -hmm. back to what the whole goal is, right? With music, with anything, is that be able to have fun. I agree with that. Yeah. So hey, be, before because I do want to talk about your record label, and we should mention to everybody to pick up the new recording. We should send everybody over. Well, first of all, mattulery dot com. So we'll send them over there. Mm -hmm. But then also your record label, which we'll talk about in a second. WoolGatheringRecords.com. You can go right there. Mm -hmm. We're going to put a direct link on YouTube and on all the other platforms after the interview, but WoolGatheringRecords.com. I know it's sitting right there on the homepage, I'm sure, too, that people can grab it. But who else is on this recording? Now, I know you play with a lot of these guys, so let's talk about who's on the recording. Yeah. And, um, you know, this music isn't usually something that I hear a lot of these guys performing on a regular basis either. Right. So, I mean, they... Really, the whole Myself ensemble included. really came together and really kind of kind of nailed this 20s style music yeah. for it not being in your wheelhouse all the time, like some other people. Mm -hmm. So who, who else is on the recording? I know James Davis yeah. and, and Steve Duncan. Oh, thanks for and, asking. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you. Well, yeah. James Davis plays trumpet. Yep. Dustin Lorenzi plays tenor saxophone. Steve Duncan mm -hmm. plays trombone. Actually, Steve does play with the Fat Baby, so he, he is probably out of any of us more cool than that style but um and then uh paul bedell plays piano and quinn kirchner plays drum set and i play sousaphone and i wrote the music so so sousaphone so i first you composed all the music and then you're playing sousaphone now i read in the liner notes that was your first instrument had you kept it up that much because i know i know you as a bass player i see you playing bass all the time yeah have you actually played sousaphone re you know before you got into this recording again um, this is actually, this is kind of what brought me back to it. Um, I didn't, like, I played all through middle school, high school, somewhat professionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I just kind of dropped it a little uh, when I was in college. Um, and I kept it up. I mean, I played like tuba gigs, church gigs, stuff like that. I was kind of like probably on, a, on the bottom of the list of uh, tuba <laughs> players doing like various gigs. But then I decided I started like oh, I'm writing the swing music and and like wouldn't the wouldn't the uh, oh I went and I went to the New Orleans I should say went to New Orleans and I was like oh man like every everyone's playing tuba <laughs> all the bass players playing tuba yeah like I want to play tuba again I was I used to be good mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so like I came home and I I uh, bought a sousaphone and started shedding and then I all of a sudden just like wrote this music and I thought that um, this is going to be, this is going to be the thing that gets me to practice sousaphone and get my chops back up and allow me to expand into, you know, all the bases mm -hmm. uh, again. And, um, and what a great limitation the sousaphone has on the music because, you know, it being the original jazz bass, um, you know, you can't really walk bass lines that easily on a, on a tuba no For anyone uh, wondering tuba no. and sousaphone are the same instrument they're just shaped differently and sousaphone wraps around you because it's for marching mm -hmm. um so um yeah you can't really you can't really walk smooth lines on a, on a tuba it's, it's just hard you gotta breathe you gotta breathe and i mean you know bass players used to double on t tuba and string bass uh, almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky to have like just started doing that as a kid uh, for some reason. But um, you know, people started playing the string bass because it was like way easier. It wasn't as loud, but it was way easier. So I mean, I feel like that instrument change in the music really took the music a whole different direction. Yeah. Just 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 the bass instrument alone. But I, I thought, well, this is perfect. I'll just this the harmony that was coming together with these melodies wasn't something that was like if I were to play bass on it, it would all feel totally different, and I would feel maybe obligated or inspired to maybe you know play more of a modern swing style. So the two beat swing 
um, where the base basically, you know, more or less the feel is on one and three instead of like one, two, three, and four. Really helped just to be a wonderful creative limitation in this project. You know, that's a great point. Um, and I, for some reason, the, the, na the, the name is escaping me, but I actually had a jazz a Sousavone player on here who also plays in all of John Williams' uh, music. He's been on Close Encounters. You hear his his tuba and oh. Sousa horn and all that. And I had him on the show a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago. And um, wow. he brought up the same thing, that, that it doesn't swing the same, but you can find that feel. And when you find that yeah. feel, it feels different than, like, bass, but it feels really mm -hmm. good. And that's what I'm hearing on this. Yeah. I mean, so... When you and Thanks. I love the fact you brought up the bass because you're right because if you would have played bass on this it would sound totally different because you just play it you yeah. play it differently you're right I mean that's that's it yeah there I just I mean I have so much much more facility on a bass <laughs> well, sure. so it's perfect it's perfect I mean like yeah give me give me more limitations <laughs> within reason I mean and, and this, to get back to what you asked earlier about the other guys in the band um, yeah um, I I realized at some point relatively recently as a as a band leader of sorts that you just gotta call the right people that are gonna that are gonna do the right that are gonna be the right person for the for the role. Yeah. Because um you know if you're lucky. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean everyone's had experiences work, working with people, maybe even their friends, and it's like it's hard, it becomes personal that um, you know, you can't change things around as easily. <laughs> So I just at some point started like thinking about it a little bit more carefully, calling the people that I knew would just crush it. Mm -hmm. So it just so happens that these, these five other guys are like five of uh, best best friends of mine. Really, I mean they're great. Oh. Um, and I know, and they're all band leaders. They all compose. They all know how to play so many different styles. I've played all kinds of rock music with all of them independently. Um, all kinds of modern jazz. All of their like their music. Other stuff of mine. Mm -hmm. um and uh i just knew that these guys would would enjoy the humor in this project and be able to really just just uh bring it to life you know yeah uh, well and and you know to your point too it's like you've got to call the right people whether it's because you're calling the right people because you know they're going to have the right attitude for what's happening and you know they can play yeah. this stuff and they're going to fit in or you just can't you can't get like some some incredible player and it this certain music's just not in their wheelhouse and they you can't stuff yeah. a square whatever they say right yeah. into a round hole i mean you just can't do it yeah. so you know what i'm trying to say and i can't say it yeah, yeah, yeah. the right way but you no, get you're it. Right. So you're right you know you just That's can't what I'm do saying. it mm -hmm. so yeah so i mean and and luckily all and i think it's also true too because of what you just said is that i mean they're all leaders they they all compose they all run their own groups they all so they know the deal they know coming in they're like yeah. okay we know exactly what's happening here let's have a great time and let's do the best we can and make it sound exactly the way matt wants it to sound so when we get on the other side we all have a great time and it sounds great so you know i think i think that's a good thing and I, i'm glad you said that because it's something that a lot of musicians, younger musicians or even older musicians that are watching and listening to this show, you know, you mm -hmm. always go and you get that all-star band that's going to back you up and then you go in the studio, you've never really played with them, but you're playing tunes and all that. Well, it doesn't sound the same as when you're playing with people that you gel with, that you've played with before and you can, and you can work through stuff and you have a different relationship. That outside mm -hmm. relationship for music is very important when you bring it into, into music, I think. I agree. Yeah. Though not exclusively, but yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. But yeah. you can obviously you can you can meet people and, and play with them and have uh, a great experience. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, for sure, it helps if you're gonna if you're gonna um, get people together, like doing rehearsals, doing shows, you know, being hanging out. It, it just especially for a fun project like this. Yeah. Um, it's like. I want to have fun with my friends <laughs> yeah. and I, I know these guys like swing their asses off and no matter what, and it's just going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. Let, now, before I let you go, let's talk a little bit because, um, you know, outside of all the composing, all the arranging, all the playing, all of, all of that, you decided that you, you just had so much extra time. You create a record label. 
<laughs> <laughs> and it, you created it for yourself. So it's woolgatheringrecords.com. But now you have other artists on this label as well, which which adds, we're expanding. Yeah, mm-hmm. which which is incredible. And and for somebody to be able to start a record label and do it the way you're doing it, which you know is like a it's a it's a record label. You have you have mm-hmm. a catalog. You're tied in with all the you know publishing companies and all that stuff. It's going out. I know the paperwork. Mm-hmm. I know the logistics. I know all of the ins and outs mm-hmm. of running that thing. That's another entity right there. You're running another business right there outside of your music stuff. Mm-hmm. So I mean, mm-hmm. did you just find like, hey, you know what? To your point, it's the D. You know, do it yourself. Well, you know what? I'm going to start my own record label so I can start putting my own stuff out on it because it, it's not going to be released the way I want it to release. If I try to get it on another label, I might as well do it myself. And then it just kind of grew and more artists kind of reached out to you. How did, how did this whole thing come, kind of come about? Yeah. Well, I, um, I had, I, I put my first two records, I guess, CDs, mm-hmm. um, out myself under the name wool gathering records back in like 2007 and eight or eight and nine, whatever that was. And, um, and, uh, just to, you know, kind of made it, made it up. Mm-hmm. And then after that, um, I did, I did a record with 482 music in New York and then, and then three records with Dave Douglas's Greenleaf music. Yeah. Um, and that's the main inspiration for doing this. Um, uh, yeah. because, you know, Dave Douglas, who is like, wow. Uh, definitely uh, somebody I deeply respect and admire and genuinely enjoy his music mm-hmm. uh, and what he's doing. He, they put out three, three of my records um, in a row. And I learned a lot about what a small jazz record label, independent label can and will do and what they don't do. And, you know, I learned a lot about working with them and I, I, I'm, I'm, deeply thankful for that time working with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was able to reach a lot of my audience with that platform. Definitely. And just the association alone. But um, so then I realized eventually that I didn't, because I I knew that I was just going to be making more recordings and they would just be continued. They would continue to be diverse stylistically. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, you know, forever, as long as I can keep doing it. So I decided it's time to basically model what I what I was doing after my experience working with a couple other labels, um, and that I could do I could do it. You know, mm-hmm. I could do it. And while I might not have the same size of uh, you know an audience, I could just start building it, and that I could just. Again, I, I'm like, I've been a professional musician exclusively my whole life since I was yeah. started playing gigs at 14, um, for like almost 25 years, I guess. Yeah. And, and, and somehow I don't really approach it as a business. I mean, that's my business, mm-hmm. but like, um, I've, I've practiced and gotten pretty good at just enjoying playing music with others. Unless someone's going to be not a nice person, of course. Right. Um, I don't like that. I don't. I don't play with those people. But um, that if I just practice having fun, no matter what the situation musically, whether I'm playing a concert of my own music on a nice stage, or if I'm playing in a wedding band for someone's happy day, or whatever, you know, if I'm doing some jobbing, I like all of it. I'm a bass player. I get to play. I get to play all kinds of styles of music. I get to, um, if it's a dance kind of thing, people dance, there's nothing wrong with that. People get a little, musicians get dark on doing that type of work as professionals, as craftspeople. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that makes their, their other creative stuff suffer, I feel like. Cause they, you know, if they're not doing enough of whatever they think they should be doing, then they get dark and bitter. And, and I, I saw that in older people when I was younger, and I decided that I was not going to do that. Mm-hmm. So my point is, like, I'm just gonna put all my energy, all of it, when it comes to music, to making the best art as I can make, and hopefully it all just falls into place. And that's what this label is. That's kind of what I'm all about when I'm when I'm doing music. I love it. Which is a lot. Yeah. I, 
I love it because you know you're you're preaching to the choir when it comes to that. When I was first starting out playing, I mean, all of us played with just you know we'd play a jazz gig with a bunch of disgruntled people because they have to go play in a wedding band over the weekend, and I'd always be like, well. Do something else then, man. Go get a go get a yeah. job. If you don't want to go play at a wedding band, you'd probably be better off working at UPS. <laughs> Maybe be more happy. I mean, yeah. what's the problem, man? You get to play. Likely. What's the yeah. problem? I know. Yeah. You know, so I, I love the totally. fact. And I, I mean, that that whole statement that you just said, it just sums the whole thing up. I mean, you love playing. You love music. And this is your business. And, and you're able to do this. And, you know, to be able to run a label the way you're running a label and to your point i mean you know you're right you're slowly building out an audience for this through the label i mean and i'm sure i mean you know yeah. more, and more artists are are jumping on the label and and you're working with more artists which is going to grow the mm -hmm. uh grow the you know audience for the label and uh it just keeps growing and growing because it's not like you're going to stop doing this anytime soon so right you know why not and i i love that yeah and i have to i have to give a shout out to uh, to Smash Plastic, they uh, do you know about them? No, I don't. Tell me. Smash Plastic is a company in Chicago, in uh, I think technically in Logan Square, mm -hmm. and they are they make they are a vinyl record pressing plant with oh. a brand new machine. Oh, nice! And um, they make our records now. Uh, they made this new record, Pollinator. We have LPs. We also so like totally. 100% made in Chicago record, uh, except for one thing, one metal plate thing I think was done somewhere in California. But um, Crest here, those guys, girls are awesome, super nice. So you work directly with them. Um, I couldn't be more pleased with with Smash Plastic and their. Yeah. I'm glad you so, brought them up. I didn't know about out. them, but I love it. Right. I mean, that's that's how we all work together and especially in the middle of a, of a situation like this, we've all got to kind of stick together and, and, and help out local people, even artists and manufacturers yep. like smash plastic. Yep. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll have to check them out. Maybe I'll have them on the show sometime so we can talk to them a little bit. Because... They're, they're, they're cool. Most of the, uh, at least, at least a few of those people I know are chirp radio DJs. Oh, they're cool. Yeah. They're music people. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, they're right. legit. I got to reach out to them. That's where that. everyone will get their records pressed from now on. If you're in Chicago <laughs> or anywhere else, if you're in Chicago, you go pick it up. They bring it to you. They put it in your car. Sweet. Have a little chat. Wear a mask. Yep. You know? Yep. I love it. Oh, that's great, man. That's great. Well, all right. So everybody should head over mattulery.com. And of course, WoolGatheringRecords.com. You've got to pick up this new recording, Pollinator. But you've got all your past recordings up there. I know that. And then sign up, yes. check check Matt out on on social, on everywhere, all all the good stuff, so you can keep track of where he's doing, what he's doing, where he's what what he's got coming out. Are you uh, are you doing any live streaming things, or do you have any performances that you're doing? I mean, I know there's a lot of people doing some social distancing stuff outside and some different things like yeah. that. Yeah, um, you know, like we were talking about how your career changed a little bit. Like right now, um, you know, I got some, I got some irons in the fire with like projects of my own. But I also am still a full time musician, mm -hmm. trying to make it work like everybody else. So I have been fortunately um, been playing uh, two, three, four days a week uh, in different um, outside front yard venues for tips and Venmo. Oh, that's um, great cash tips and electric tips i'll give us i'll give a plug for smash plastic i didn't mean to give a plug to venmo so anyway e, e tips you know been doing that um for a few months you know I, I wasn't really obviously making music with anybody um online or otherwise mm -hmm. and then i got some opportunities to, to play live in real time outside this summer and uh it's turned me around man it's uh That's it's great. really i appreciate it so much the opportunity and just just to play with with some good folks for some people it's i mean i took so much for granted before so i realize now don't do that right <laughs> don't take that for granted no. um i actually i also did um pollinator it just so happens the band uh we're doing a we're taping a live stream tomorrow a constellation for the millennium park series of jazz festival oh nice excellent yeah, so you, I think you mentioned earlier 
someone else had done one of those tapings. Yeah, we had Denise Times over at uh, Epiphany. That's right. Yeah, so you're doing something uh, at Constellation. That's great. Yep, um, we're doing that finally. We're doing it tomorrow. In fact, I'm also taping a set with Nick Mazzarella Trio mm -hmm. um, tomorrow. And I taped one with Tito Carrillo Quintet a couple days ago. Um, that's kind of the extent of my streaming life. I'm not doing a ton of that stuff. I haven't really been asked to. I'm not turning it down or anything. It's just like, um, I'm, I'm down. I just, you know, yeah. just keep a keen eye, keen eye out for all the opportunities. Well, and that's, and, uh, that's all we can do like, now, right? I, yeah. And I played a couple of gigs at Andy's this weekend. Oh, okay, um, cool. With my, with my trio, Paul Bedell and John Deitemeyer. Mm -hmm. Um, that was definitely the first, uh, gig in a club that uh any of us had done um with an audience you know yeah well so that was kind of kind of crazy but I, it felt great i'm glad those guys i'm glad chris and jeff and everybody over at andy's they're 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 trying to do something and trying to trying yep. to you know get back to normal some sort of no, normality as much as they can but i mean you know you know, everybody's kind of trying to sift our way through this. As I always say on this show, yeah. this is like the worst industry to be in because our whole deal is to get as many people together as possible to enjoy I music. Know. And it's like, you can't do that. You better right like now. what you do. You better like it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> hey, Matt, congratulations on the new recording. I really appreciate you jumping on. And, and as I mentioned before, we came on. At some point, you and I are going to sit down. We're going to do a feature interview for Chicago Jazz Magazine. And then we can really cool. delve into everything that, that – because I, I've got a million questions that I could ask you about composition and about how you started playing and about all the different genres you play and everything else. But we won't do that now because we don't have time. But we will cool. do it at some point, hopefully in the near Great. future, when we can be in the same room together and uh, <laughs> and talk. Uh -huh. So that will be exciting. But, hey, congratulations. So, man, really digging the recording. I encourage everybody to head over to the different websites and pick it up. And uh, – Great, man. Thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I um, can't thank you enough for, for telling somebody, man. And uh, congratulations on 18 years of Chicago Jazz Magazine. Yeah, wow, geez. I know. I feel old already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt. Have a good evening, yeah. and uh, we'll catch All up right, soon, man. hopefully. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. All right, Matt Eulery. I'm telling you, this recording uh, is something to really check out because – I listened to it. I, I wasn't sure what I was going to expect to hear. And I took a listen. I was like, oh, man, it's really hip. And and it's hipped up for the year. You know what I mean? So it, it, it doesn't sound like straight out of 1920s. It sounds like Matt's writing, but he's writing to pay homage to the 1920s. So. Again, congratulations to Matt. So glad we got to have him on, and, and please go check that out. Now, tomorrow, back here, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, we are announcing guests every day. Thursday, Friday of this week, we're taking off, so we're going to do episode 86 tomorrow. Do not miss it. Of course, as I always say, if you like what you hear, please tell your family, tell your neighbors, call the grandkids, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Hopefully everybody stays safe, stays healthy, and until then, I will see you on the next broadcast.